Hey, so in this week of further exploring what is and isn't possible within Blender, I discovered a new add-on that I really want to share with you guys and kind of talk about because I think it's super cool. It's also free. Um, it is this add-on, I found it from this video here by Alpha Magenta. Uh, it came out about a year ago, which is I believe around the time the add-on got released. It's called Differential Growth. The add-on was made by this man right here, Boris, and I'm not gonna say his last name because there's no way I say that right. Um, I believe he's just a one-man team working on this. So the differential growth add-on actually mimics cell growth in real life. And I'll maybe try to break that down a little bit later. Um, but this is, it, it's a super cool, very unique uh, type of add-on. And it's one of those things where I think the use cases for this are only as limited as you make it. I was able to use it here in this animation uh, as the kind of flowery growth in the background. By the way, the breakdown for this whole video is on my Patreon link in the description down below. We can talk about that more towards the end of the video, but I've wasted enough of your time. Let's get into this. So first thing you want to do, you're going to want to go to the GitHub page, which I'll have linked down in the description, and you're going to download the source code. You're going to run and install it, you know, edit preferences, add-ons, just like you would install any other add-on. And then we're going to start with our base mesh. We could start with really any base mesh. However, this add-on really only functions best when it's manipulating edges. So if we were to take this cube and then inset here, we have these edges along the outside. If we select all of those and go over to our vertex group, select assign, make a new vertex group for them, right? Now we can start to manipulate just this. With just this plane, we can actually create the, the basics for a lot of effects. If you tab over into your object properties menu, you will see that the differential growth add-on is in here. It functions more like a script. Something I'd recommend is if you haven't already, come over here to your settings, to your system, and make your undo steps 256. It's a very helpful tip from the tutorial that I showed at the very beginning of the video. Uh, and you'll see that as we click differential growth step down here, we are running the script each time we click it. So we'll see subtle growth. And as we kind of spam this, we could see that it starts to manipulate. And after a certain point, you can see that it starts to take off in other directions and it's subdividing and splitting. And we're getting this like very organic, weird looking shape. Now, if we control Z all the way back to where we were before, I can kind of break down some of these uh, settings on the side over here. Now, let's start with the very first one. We have our split radius. Our split radius is kind of a limit on how big of an angle can be between two edges before it splits them and subdivide, subdivides them. So while you're growing, if we switch over to wireframe mode here and we start spamming this, you can see that these are growing in like in line with each other, but at a certain point, they start to split away from each other. And that's because they exceed this split radius. So if we were to take this and mark it to say 0.25, it's going to start splitting at a much smaller radius and we get much more geometry going on, right? Now, personally, I wouldn't recommend this till we start getting to the end of our shape, but this is something you could do from the get go and you can kind of let it do its thing. And you do get some really kind of a corally looking effects here. Let's go ahead and control Z back to our default area. So while we're still in wireframe view here, if we look now, we've got our repulsion radius. And what this is, is how far away our steps are gonna grow each time we run this uh, this step. So if we change this from its default one to like 0.25 and run this, you can see that we've got substantially less growth happening. Next, we've got our step size, and this is going to be how much it grows on each time we run this little bit of code. If we crank it up and then run it, you can see that it, it can really go crazy. That one's definitely very situational on when you want to adjust that. I find that the, the 0.1 like default uh, number there works pretty good. Next, we have our forces. We have our attraction factor, which is pretty simple. When you run your step, it's how attracted to itself the object is. Repulsion is the exact opposite, how far it's gonna push each other away. The noise is going to be, you know, how how jagged, how, how kind of displaced the mesh is going to be when it forms. Our noise scale is how big that displacement is going to be. And our seed just changes our seed. But something else cool in here is our growth direction factor. So if we were to spawn in, say, a sphere, an icosphere, whatever, it doesn't really matter as long as it's an object, we can then take our little eyedropper tool, select our icosphere, and set this to one and maybe like 0.5 for our repulsion radius. And then our growth direction factor, if we set this to like two maybe, you'll see as we click this, we're actually growing towards our sphere. And the more you click, the more it's gonna grow up there. You're gonna get the same kind of subdivisions. You know, we've got it set very uh, low right now, so a little mesh. But yeah, the object will grow towards another object. 
The only things that I'm not so sure on are our base factor and our shell factor. After a couple of days of playing and reading up on this, I just wasn't able to find a ton of information. So for the most part, I've just left them alone. But yeah, now that we've gone over the basics of how the add-on actually works, let's go through and make something with it. Um, we're gonna go over how I made what is in the thumbnail for this video. Now, how I did that was with a circle, and then I went into edit mode, I pressed E, S, zero, to bring our faces into the center, then you can just right click wireframe, select this M and then at center. Oh, <laughs> um, but make sure that you're in the vertices selection mode, not edge selection mode. Otherwise your sphere is just gonna disappear. Um, so yeah, at center. And now we've got, uh, I forget the word for this. For the life of me, I can't remember what this is called, but we're gonna select our outer layer here. And we're gonna extrude up and then we're gonna scale out. And this outer layer now is going to be what we select for our vertex group. So again, just select assign. And then with all default settings again, just kind of let it go crazy for a little bit. You could really just keep spamming this for like a very long time before you start to get to what you're seeing. So yeah, for this one, we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to leave the basic settings. We're gonna drop this down to 0.5 and then this one down to 0.25. Run a few more steps here until we're almost touching. You really don't want them like interacting with each other. It kind of breaks the immersion in my opinion. So get them close, but not touching or intersecting. If they are, you can play with your attraction action, your repulsion, you can control Z a few times, you know, mess around with some of the settings here. And for our last section, we're going to drop these down to point one again until we can get those little fine details in here. And now we've got these like weird, again, like leafy, corally, underwater type thing. Now, same steps as before, we're gonna throw a solidify on it and then throw a subdiv. When you add a solidify, play with the direction that you want it to go because the mesh is so close together, there's gonna be clipping here and there with it. So choose the direction that causes the least amount of clipping without disrupting your shape. So now we have our subdiv on and we've got a pretty similar shape going on to what was in our thumbnail. So let's set up a basic scene real quick. I've not shown this, I don't think, but to make these little backgrounds that I do, it's very simple. You drop in a plane, you throw a little loop cut here, you know, center it wherever you want. It doesn't really matter because you can kind of readjust it. Drag this end up here, select this edge, and then just bevel it. And now you've got this like shaded backdrop that you would see in like a photography studio or on a film set. There's a word for what this is. I don't remember what it is. It's been a long time since I was in school. I also haven't really shown my, my default lighting setup at all, uh, or at least I haven't explained it. I generally like to use area lights um, because you can control how harsh and how soft they are very easily. I like to do one side light and kind of crank this up depending on the scale of our object here. That's super important. We're fairly large. So we're probably going to be somewhere around like the 1500 mark there. And then we're going to duplicate this, kind of make this more of a flat light. We're going to place this just slightly off to the side that has our main light on it. And you get this kind of like newer style of like advertising lighting. You'll see this type of lighting a lot in like newer tech commercials and things. We're going to set our camera to something like a hundred millimeters, something that's got like very close up, you know, feel to it. Very, very claustrophobic, I guess. You can throw in rendered view and we can see that our lighting is about normal. We might have to play with it a little bit, you know, drag this forward, maybe play with our angles. Depends on our mesh and where our shadows are falling. I'm also going to make this top light a little bit bigger and a little bit brighter, maybe something like 2,500. Just so it's, it's a little bit more washed out along the tops there, but we're keeping some of our inner shadows. All right, so next we are going to work on our shader for this. Shader on this isn't super complicated, but I did play around with it a little bit. I went through a lot of variations with this. During the testing for this, I played with so many different combinations of shape and light and color and putting it on certain objects. There, there's a ton of possibilities. All right, so first things first, we're gonna drop in a color ramp up here and we're gonna connect this to our mapping node, get rid of that image texture. We do not need it, but we are going to drop a noise texture there. And then we're gonna plug our color ramp into our output here. All right, so let's play around with our colors first, actually. And we're gonna do with some pastels, I think. I've been really feeling like pinks and oranges lately. So we're gonna start with that. So you can see that we're just kind of like, we have this like mix going on right now. Um, if we switch over into our material view, we might be able to see a little bit better where our noise is actually interacting. We actually we probably crank this up or down a little bit. Oh, we're also, we're plugged into UV. We need to be plugged into generated. That's my bad. Um, it defaults sometimes to UV. I'm not sure what makes that happen. Usually if it doesn't have a UV, it won't default to that, but sometimes it does. So you can see we've got our noise kind of moving around in our object here, which is only making a slight difference, but that's fine for the moment. We're gonna add in some more colors here, maybe 
like a, a red here. And now you can see that this is definitely making like a very big difference. Um, maybe in between these, we had like a yellow, but like eh, maybe even like more like of a, a yellow orange. And then here at the end, maybe like a, a light blue. Now here you can kind of play with your noise values until you get something that you like. In the original, I was at uh, like 5.600 zero, zero, and then like negative 17, negative 20 maybe. I'm not exactly sure what the exact were for this. Right now, negative 17, it doesn't look as good on this object, so I'm actually gonna change it up. Uh, maybe something like this. I, I quite, I don't quite like how like small that is. I don't want it to be a bit bigger, like this maybe. So then we're gonna come over, we're gonna turn our subsurf up and we're gonna play with our subsurf radius. Now, if you don't know, the way that light penetrates an object is what's causing your subsurf in an object. And these values are Roy G. Biv, your RGB, what is being bounced back at the camera, right? So typically something good to keep in mind is that it bounces back the opposite color of what you're putting in. So if our surface of our object is red, the light that's going to be reflected back at us is going to be a blue color. So we're gonna play with these values till we hit something that we like. Sometimes it's definitely better to do this in rendered mode. You get a more accurate representation of it. Um, I typically like to kind of crank the first one when I'm doing warmer colors. And then the second one always brings out like an egregious amount of yellow. So if you're gonna use it, I would go light with it. And then maybe we bring in some of this like pink and blue. I kind of, I'm kind of feeling it right now. I know we just set everything up with warm colors and now we're immediately going towards like colder tones, but I kind of like it. So yeah, something like this is where I'm sitting right now. It might be different for your object depending on, you know, what you've done with it. Um, we're gonna lower our roughness just a little bit. It's, you know, somewhere about a quarter of the way through. And then we are gonna actually, we're gonna just snag this noise texture from up here and we're gonna drop in a bump. We're gonna go color to height and then normal to normal. Switch back over to material mode so we can view this just a little bit easier. And now we're gonna crank this all the way up. So like 110 is probably a good value, somewhere in there. And we're gonna play with our roughness and our detail. Change our roughness all the way to one. And then our distortion, we're gonna turn up a little bit more, but not too high, because you start to lose some of the detail. And if you're using denoiser, it'll kind of get eaten up a little bit anyways. Something that almost looks like skin is what I'm kind of going for here. Like a little bit like, swirly skin, I guess. From there, we're gonna paste in my custom glass shader, which by the way, can be found in the description down below in my Discord. It was in my Gumroad, but Gumroad keeps removing my project files. I'm not sure why, I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end of the video, but yes, the shader is available for free in my Discord. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna snag these guys here, and we are gonna plug these into a mix shader. We're gonna plug both of these guys into our shader and then our color into our factor and then our shader into our surface. Now give it a second. It's gonna kind of lag for a minute loading in this shader. Um, what we're gonna wanna do once it is loaded in is drop in a color ramp right here. And we're gonna try to find our line where they are mixing at, which I'd say right there looks pretty solid. And now we can play with our noise scale here and we can kind of change where it's going to be glass and where it's going to be our kind of subsurfy plant material. I don't want too much glass. I just kind of want a hint of it. So maybe even towards where we were when it first came in would be nice. Switch over to rendered mode and see what we're looking like right now. I, I want a little bit more glass than this. So let's move around our values here and see if we can bring out some more glass. It's definitely more glass there. Okay, so we're gonna open up this node group and in here are our three colors and we can kind of manipulate these to fit our colors a little bit better. So let's change uh, maybe the blue. Well, let's go more towards like a purple somewhere in here. Oh wow, that's very like fiery. So maybe we don't go quite there. We go to like this kind of like in between yellow and green and then we change our green value something more in line with where we are. Something like that. And as you can see, it's very, very noisy already. We can kind of play around with our bottom value too if we want to. We can even, we can kind of go more clear tone. We can go more red, whatever you're really feeling. This is just changing our fraction of our glass, which does make it less realistic, but we're not going for something that's based in our reality, I don't think. Now I've rendered out a little preview image here and I honestly, I think it's fine. I think this looks pretty good. Um, we can play with our lighting a little bit. I think some spots are a little too flat. Some spots are definitely being hit too hard by the side light. But overall, I think it's like a good place to start. 
From there, you just drag it into your editing software of choice, whether that's Photoshop or Lightroom or After Effects, and you, you play with your colors, you play with your noise, and you end up with this render that is so free. So I just wanted to say thank you to Boris again here at the very end for making a wonderful free add-on that is super accessible and allows people to, you know, kind of continue creating this generative art style within Blender. It's super rad. Um, again, it is linked down in the description below, so please go check it out. Speaking of making things more accessible for people that want to create, I'm going to be no longer using my Gumroad. I'm not sure what the issue is, but last week when I uploaded, they removed my project files and I had to put them back up again. Um, they removed like the files within them, but the project file itself stayed public. So I was getting DMs saying, hey, there's nothing in this. There's nothing to download. Um, I'm not sure why this is happening, but I don't want it to happen again. So going forward for all the videos that I make, the project files will be available in my Discord down below, and those project files will always be free. If I'm making a tutorial on something, you can always have the project file. However, I am kind of trying something new. I opened up a Patreon page. And by no means do I expect anybody to go through and pay for this. If you would like to, that would be awesome. And it would help me a lot kind of pursue this. I'm not sure that YouTube is something that I'll pursue full time as I have a full time job and other engagements, but this could help lead towards a road where that's possible. And that sounds fun. So on my Patreon, you can find extra things each week, whether that's new project files or just kind of like a basic tutorial or whole new things. There will also be a breakdown of this video that I put on my Twitter yesterday, where I'm gonna upload a four part series, just breaking down each and every scene so that it's readily available. The project files will be available on my Patreon, just stuff like that. Sorry, I don't wanna talk your ear off about giving me money. But yeah, thank you to Alpha Magenta for making the initial video on differential growth. And I'm realizing while editing this that Alpha Magenta is Boris's YouTube channel. So thank you to Boris for making this. Kind of funny that I never noticed that, but uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that I was able to help you kind of learn something from this and I will see you guys again real soon.